ezt az objektum, hogy a de Restoration of the Media Contractors, és az a Google különböző Company, újra azt hiszem, hogy a volt hol van a Google de sajnálom, hogy a program sem börjön, azt hiszem, hogy Afrika volt. Och sen efter det, den här presentationen så kommer det serveras eh, enklare förtäring och dryck här utanför. Eh, och givetvis eh, frågor har vi väldigt gärna under ett eh, när, ni, när ni känner för oss. Redan några frågor helt enkelt. Så än en gång, tack så mycket för att ni har kommit hit ikväll. Och jag tänkte lämna över till eh, Lukas Lundin som ju är stor aktieägare i båda de här bolagen som får säga några av dem, eh, sina tankar kring eh, Channel and Petroleum och eh, Afrikor. Tack! Maybe I switched English, everybody behind you can understand what I'm talking about. Anyway, uh, we're going to talk about Shamran first. This is a big camera. I think Shamran has come quite a long way in the last years or so. You know, we had high impact wells in Kurdistan and we had some dry holes, so we finally found a very interesting field called Akush. And we got a new partner called Saka Saka, a Dubai National Company. And now we're in, uh, on our way to put this field into production, and we're talking with quite a big number, and that probably has happened in early 2014. We're also building a third delineation well in the Akush field. That looks very, very interesting. We should get results in the next month or so. Right? Yeah, okay. So I think that story is finally evolving. It's been a long way to get there, but it's finally going to create clear conclusion. And then we also have Steep Hill here, which everybody knows about Africa oil, which is the where well, we found a new base in the world. There's not that many around. New base in August 2012, 13. Base oil basin, so this is a new one in Kenya. And uh, we had early success last year there, and it looks very, very encouraging. And now we're drilling three wells and testing one. And uh, the results uh, are hopefully going to be favorable. And uh, it's going to take a little while to prove up the basin because it's very, very large. It's the size of the North Sea. So, you know, it's going to. The news comes, they're not very fast, but uh, so far everything is extremely encouraging and it can, could become very, very valuable over time now for the next 12 to 18 months. Anyway, now we think we're going to talk with Tadeem, maybe we can start with Shamaran and then maybe this is the key to looking forward to your speeches. Thanks. To start by explaining this picture, this is a picture of the second test, and then on the approach to well, what you're seeing is about 6,000 barrels of flow. In this well, you can imagine we flowed about 42,000 barrels today on three tests. So, this just gives you the idea of the magnitude of what we're talking about here. Shamran is, is the vehicle which we use for our activities in northern Iraq or Kurdistan region. That's as it is called. Because this sounds like a very interesting story. Basically, nothing happened for more than 60 years, and when we got in in 2008, 2009, what we were really talking of activity or field of prospects, which should have been drilled in any, anywhere else in the world about 50 years ago. So basically, it was the time wrap in which we got in to look at some of the most exciting secret onshore secrets in the world. The lowest of the of the hanging fruit, which you can always, which you could imagine. The story has evolved over the last five years, six years now, and even you know it's the Middle East, so you always have the skill set forward and one step backward kind of scenario. But what we are seeing today is having a significant momentum, forward momentum going forward. What has happened in Kurdistan in the last six years is something unimaginable. The region attracts interest from just about everybody in the oil industry. Erbil has been tagged as the exploration capital of the world. We currently have more than 40 companies working there, including super majors such as Exxon, Chevron, Gazprom, Total, and, and a number of other big companies waiting to get into Kurdistan. There's a long list out there. 
the activity level in the, in the region remains extremely high. We've seen, as I mentioned, we've seen super majors and international outcomes is already there. And the interest is so much that we see a lot more companies trying to get into the region. In terms of production, from a zero start in 2006, where there was only one well and I think 600 barrels of production, today we are talking of 300,000 barrels of production by the end of the year, possibly going up to a million barrels in the next two and a half, three years. So from a zero start to today, about a million barrels of production capacity. In, similarly, in terms of uh, refining, etc., zero to today, which is about 150,000 barrels per day, going up to 200 to 250,000 barrels in the next year, year and a half. The story of Kurdistan is kind of totally intertwined. It's, it's not in Iraq. So Baghdad and KRG have been a challenge, to say the least. The, re the relationship still remains very challenging. However, you know, we've seen a lot of development. What, what we hear is kind of different than what we see on the ground. The recent reports have indicated that there is progress between KRG and Baghdad in resolving some of the export issues. And, you know, the payments which have been due to some of the companies which have exported oil in 2011 and 12. However, you know, the Baghdad relationship is one part of the equation. The bigger part of the equation, which frankly, when we first went into Kurdistan, we never thought would ever happen, is the significant developments in the Turkish and the KRG relationship. This is just absolutely amazing in the sense that six years back, if you ever mentioned Kurdistan in Turkey, you could be jailed for it. Today, we're talking about Turkey becoming pretty much the major, you know, the most significant player in this region especially within, within northern Iraq. It is a major trading partner. There's about control of our, uh, Kurdistan is the imports into Kurdistan from Turkey are about 70 to 80 percent of the imports. There's an energy cooperation agreement which was signed last year, which basically kind of ties the two countries together, two regions together, the North Kurdistan region and Turkey in an energy pact. And last, lastly, a very, very significant development. Up till now, what has happened is, Turkey has always said that exports of oil through Turkey would go through Baghdad. The significant change in the last couple of months has been that Turkey has started accepting oil, direct oil from Kurdistan. Currently, this is happening by trucking, where two of, two of the bigger producers in Kurdistan are trucking the exports into Turkey. And these, these truck if, if, if these truck uh, oil is being sold on the international market. The third just sold a 30,000 ton consignment on the international market. So effectively, we've seen a sea change in the in the uh, issue about export of oil. Now, but that, though important, is really not the only uh, only player in that region. And Turkey is going to take more and more significant uh, role in the Turkish exports. And in a way, it suits Turkey because it's, it's a win-win situation for them on all issues, political, economic, and their, you know, the wider geopolitical interests that they want to create in the region. Uh, I'll start by coming down to the infrastructure. The big issue in Kurdistan always was if there was enough resources, where, how do you take the oil out? And the only earlier option was to go through Baghdad, which was the Kirkuk uh, Jehan pipeline in Turkey. But now, we now see a developing regional and international export pipelines, which is going to be a significant mover in this whole equation. The pipeline from Sarkha to Kurbala has already been built. It's, it was commissioned recently. We're looking at the pipeline from Kurbala to Doho, which is a gas pipeline going from here to Doho, which has been converted into an oil pipeline. And the construction of the Doho to Peshkabur pipeline which is also in progress. Effectively, what this means is that we, we get a Kurdish pipeline which does not touch Baghdad, and because Turkey is now willing to accept oil from Kurdistan, we will see the imports of the, uh, the exports of oil from Kurdistan into Turkey pretty much by the end of the year, and the capacity is likely to be increased. What's going to happen is currently this capacity is about 300,000 barrels per day, which should be by the end of the year 2013. We're looking at, you know, KRG is looking at putting in two major pumping stations here. 
which will effectively bring the pipeline capacity to a million barrels per day by 2014. So this basically gives you the market for the existing and the new production which is going to come in to the region to be exported out. In addition to this, there's a lot of talk about incremental pipelines. There's this heavy oil pipeline which is being talked about very close to the Shaikhan block just uh, south of Ashkosh. There's another pipeline which is a gas pipeline which is probably going this way into Turkey. So what we are seeing is the flowering of the Turkish-Turkish relationship which is kind of pinned by the energy requirements of Turkey and we see that this, this basically should enable the current production and the future production coming into the markets to be able to be exported and basically realize the price which we've all been hoping for for the last couple of years. Coming to our history, as Lucas mentioned, it, uh, you know, we were one of the bigger players in Kyrgyzstan. We had some disappointing results in, in, in our Polkana block, but we were able to basically you know, focus on probably one of the you know, one of the best fields in the region, a world-class field called Atush. Atush 1, which is where we had announced it as a major discovery in the Jurassic, the GSAM, in April 2011. Atush 2, which was our second well, proved to be one of the biggest wells in Kyrgyzstan. Uh, it confirmed an additional two reservoirs, the Adia and the Butma. In terms of test rates, Basically, Atush 2 tested 42,200 barrels, a number of anywhere else in the world, and that too was to Spain. So, they, we basically tested 42,200 barrels from the BSEP. We made significant progress after the Atush 2 well. We declared the field commercial in November 2012, and we have put together a field development plan which has been filed with the KRG. So, in terms of the overall picture, we are very much advanced in terms of uh, quite a few other operators uh, as to where we are in the field appraisal development scenario. The other important development from our perspective was that we now have a new contract agreement. Earlier we had a private American company which was more inclined towards not making significant capital commitments going forward. That company was bought out by Abu Dhabi National Energy Company which is a $30 billion company arm of the Abu Dhabi government. And they became they came in as in early early in the year. The transaction was closed at the end of 2012 and became the new operator. Showing the significance of the field, uh, basically the Kurdish government has backed in with a 25% interest. Shamram now owns GEP, the company which has got the license in Kurdistan. So we so the partnership, a very strong partnership consisting of Taka, KRG, Shamram, and Marathon having an interest in this field. Atush discovery. Just to kind of give you an idea about what the Atush discovery is all about. Basically, we're talking of a significant oil power of over 800 meters in the, at the crest of the structure. So you're really talking of an oil power which extends right across. Initially, you know, we, we were talking about the Jurassic Reservoir and six zones or six reservoirs. Now we see that this is not six reservoirs, what we're talking of is one, basically six reservoirs interconnected, one huge tank up there. The, the reservoir is type one, which is fractures, type two, which is matrix, and, in, and a mix of both. So we see type one, type two reservoirs. We're talking of multi tasky permeabilities from an extensive fracture system. It gives you a PI of 200, uh, 200 barrels per day per PSI drawdown. So, I mean, these parameters are unmatched, even in some of the bigger fields which, uh, which have been discovered earlier. And in terms of productivity, we have already been able to prove up to, uh, to produce up to 15,000 barrels per day uh, with, uh, with the ESP, and this was facilities constrained. This could have been pushed further. In terms of numbers, again, as I said, a world-class field, huge numbers. In 2011, we closed out with 465 million barrels uh, of 2C contingent resources. In 2012, this increased to about 627, a 35% increase, and the discovered petroleum in place of 2.6, 2.7 million barrels. The discovered petroleum in place is a very significant number here because currently based, because we haven't gone into commercial production, we're talking of recovery rates of 22, 23%. 
But the fields of this kind can grow up to 30 to 40 percent easily just on normal production. And you're talking about if you add EOR, then it's an even increase. These numbers, just based on a couple of months of production, could go dramatically higher. Geographically, we can't extend it too much because we've already covered the whole block. But in terms of just a change of parameters, these fields could be significantly larger. All it will take is six months to 12 months of production to do up or deliver uh, our third party auditors as to what we see. In terms of, and the high case, four billion barrels, pretty much around a billion barrels of recovery in this case. We're also talking, this is just, not, this is what we've already discovered. We're also talking about prospective resources in the field, and I'll talk about it in detail, which is uh, looking at about another 100 to 233 million barrels of resources, which is the potential upside, which we'll you know, drill ahead and drill along as we go along. The upside. We we have, you know, what we've done is we've basically proven the Jurassic. We haven't even touched the Cretaceous. Uh, the Cretaceous, the reservoir on top of the Jurassic, basically has potential uh, here, which is the hanging wall and the uh, and the football tracks. We've seen oil shows in this, and we would be building a dedicated well uh, sometime in the future to basically prove up the Cretaceous. We've got map Jurassic uh, closures, that's the blue and violet here, which is basically below the Jurassic. This is about 3,800, 3,900 meters. Again, we have a dedicated well to be, to be drilled somewhere in the future to test out the, the, the map Jurassic closures here. In addition, we have this 